Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Legends of the Jedi. Last episode, we finished talking about the first arc in the Tales of the Jedi, the Golden Age of the Sith. This time, we're going to cover the first three issues of the next arc, the fall of the Sith Empire. So Fall was published between June and October 1997. As with the Golden Age, the story and dialogue was conceived by Kevin J. Anderson, and again we have amazing art from Dario Carrasco Jr., and it really helps bring these stories to life. Fall consisted of five issues in total. The inside cover page of the first issue features a Star Wars comics timeline. If you remember from our first episode, the Golden Age of the Sith took place around 5,000 years BBY, or before the Battle of Yavin. Well, now we're told that the Fall of the Sith Empire arc takes place 4,990 years BBY. So, about a 10-year time difference. And it's not really explained where this 10-year time difference comes from. Was that a 10-year time difference that took place over the course of the Golden Age arc? Or is this 10-year time difference something that's to come? Because uh, I can tell you from the first issue, we jump right into it. It takes place literally hours after the end of the Golden Age arc. So we're going to revisit this at the end of next episode while we try and figure out where this 10-year time difference comes from. The first issue itself is called Desperate Measures, and the opening scrawl does a good job of recapping our story so far. So without further ado, here it is in its entirety. 5,000 years before the birth of Luke Skywalker, young Gavin Jory Derrigan accidentally set in motion one of the most devastating wars this galaxy has ever known. Fleeing from troubles in the Koros system, which has been newly unified by the benevolent Empress Tita, Gav and Jory race into unexplored hyperspace, hoping to make their fortune, but their path lands them right into the heart of the awesome Sith Empire. Taken prisoner by Sith Lords, Gav and Jory are used as pawns by the ambitious Nagasado. He has just declared himself the new Dark Lord. The twins spend weeks hiding under Sado's treacherous protection, while the Dark Lord begins training Gav in the Sith magic of illusions. Little do they know that Nagasado has plans to use the brother and sister as scapegoats. He wishes to expand the Sith Empire, to launch a war of conquest against the Republic. But first he must defeat his deadly rival, Ludo Kresh. Dropping hints and planting spies, Sado lures Kresh into attacking his seemingly vulnerable fortress. In the full devastation of battle, Sado separates Gav and Jory, forcing Jory to take their impounded ship, Starbreaker 12, to escape alone back to the heart of the Republic. After Jory flees, Sado springs his surprise on Ludo, wiping out his rival's fleet, while Ludo himself barely escapes. Now with his opponent trounced, Sado can move the military might of the Sith Empire onto its greatest conquest, against the unsuspecting Republic. A secret transmitter hidden on Jory's ship will tell them exactly where to go. Okay, so there's the recap. And now that this storyteller is fully armed and operational, we can jump right into it. The issue opens with Jory racing through hyperspace back towards the Republic. Like I said earlier, this happens hours after the Golden Age arc ends. This is a trip that's far longer than most hyperspace explorers would ever dare take. Tears stream down Jory's face. After all, she was forced to leave her brother Gav behind. As Jory disengages the hyperdrive, she almost collides with this massive space fortress. She maneuvers out of the way, and we learn she's made it all the way back to her home at Sinegar. She opens a comm channel to the planet's control tower and tells them that she has urgent information. Here she says, Repeat, emergency, this is Jory Derrigan on the Starbreaker 12, and I have information. Unfortunately for Jory, the space traffic control workers recognize the name of her ship and decide to alert security. If you remember from episode 2, Arba the Hutt appealed directly to Empress Tita to arrest Gavin Jory for stealing the ship if they ever returned to Sinegar. So it wouldn't surprise me if there was some kind of wanted poster of Gavin Jory lying around somewhere that they'd seen. Anyways, two patrol ships escort Jory down to the planet, and they warn her to stay on course. Now, at this point, Jory doesn't really know that she's a wanted fugitive. She chalks up this vigilance to tighten security procedures. Here we see that her ancient ship is literally being tugged to the ground by a bunch of dock workers holding ropes, almost as if it was some kind of old-timey sailboat being pulled towards a dock. When Jory disembarks from her ship, she is confronted by guards. One of them comes forth and he says, Jory Derrigan, you're under arrest for grand theft, firing upon Senegal security ships, destruction of property, fraud. The list goes on. We're told by this captain of the guards that she will at least get a trial. The ancient world motifs are pretty strong here. We have pyramid-like structures in the distance, the guards are wearing what appear to be bronze armor with shoulder pauldrons, and these large conical hats. They're also sporting these ancient-looking rifles, which are now pointed all at Jory. At this point, the scene changes on the next page, and we're back at Cardelba in the Sith Empire. Sith laborers are hard at work, repairing the damage done by Ludo Crush's fleet. 
Gav and Sato are standing next to one another, watching their progress. Gav marvels at how fast they're working. Sato chuckles and says, Hmm, Ludo's attack is just like Ludo himself, insignificant and quickly forgotten. The glory of the Sith Empire will endure forever. It is our destiny. Anyone can see that. He then asks Gav to hold out his hand, and he gives him a handful of jewels, like frozen specks of time. He bets that Gav has never seen such opulence in the Republic. This entire exchange kind of reminds me of that scene in Hook, you know, the Peter Pan movie with Robin Williams. Captain Hook has captured uh, Peter Pan's son, and he's all like, Hey, Jack, I can be a better father to you than your own father can. Join with me. It's clear Sato is trying to buy off Gav's devotion. He throws up his arms and declares that all of the Sith Lords have sworn allegiance to him, and that the Sith Empire has a bright future ahead of it. He declares that the Republic will give them everything that they need, and he wants Gav to be a part of that future. Despite the bribe, Gav has his misgivings. He's not ready to betray the Republic. After all, it was his home. But you can see his mind is starting to turn as he remembers the death of his parents, and how both he and Jory had to live in poverty after his parents died. Sato tells Gav, with a straight face, to think of all the other people suffering under the yoke of the Republic. He calls it an oppressive system, even. This coming from a man who literally has slaves. Anyways, he finally convinces Gav to help him, and Gav justifies his decision by saying he'll be doing it for Jory. So back to Jory, we see that she's being restrained by guards. She tells them, Look, you don't understand. I have a dire warning. I've just come from the Sith Empire and I need to talk to the Empress. The guards respond by laughing at her. They're all like, Oh, the big scary Sith are gonna get us. Ooh, the fairy tale. Before Jory's hauled off to the detention center, Arba the Hutt comes forth and asks to speak with her. He tells her that he never thought she would be dumb enough to return to Sinagar. She tries to appeal to Arba and tells him how happy she is to see him, but he isn't having any of it. He tells her he doesn't want to hear it. Hasn't he been fed enough lies already? He reminds her that he took her in after her parents were killed, and that he even ignored her debts, which for a hut is probably a very hard thing to do. He trusted her, and she took complete advantage of him. In a bit of a heartbreaking scene, Arba turns his back on a weeping Jory and floats away on his hovering chair. In a last-ditch effort, she tells him that Gav is a prisoner of the Sith Empire, and that they're coming to attack the Republic. Arva turns back for a moment and shakes his head. Jory, ho ho, these lies will only make it worse for you. Then who should show up but the lizard merchant we talked about in the first episode, Sik Kahur. He tells the guards that the Starbreaker 12 is his by rights. It's partial payment for the losses covered by the treachery and incompetence of Jory and her fugitive brother. If you remember, they sold a hyperspace route that ended up getting one of his merchant ships destroyed. Jory begins to cry even harder. She tells the guards that Kahur can't take Starbreaker 12. It holds the coordinates to find her brother. She tells them that they have to rally the Republic forces. This guard's like, look, kid, we don't have to do anything except take you into custody. So with that, her ship is given away to the Trandoshan merchant, and Jory is hauled off to jail. At this point, the story brings us to the palace of Empress Tita. Our Jedi friend Odan Ur is hard at work, poring over old, dusty tomes. Mehmet Nadil enters the room, and he's all like, Oh, you're studying again. Why am I not surprised? Odin Ur tells him that with all the traveling they've done, the opportunity to actually just sit down and study and meditate has become very rare these days. Nadil's like, well, it'll have to wait because the Empress wants to see you. Odin Ur closes his book and he moves aside some scrolls. He's like, Nadil, what's this about? Does she need me for another pageant or parade or inspection tour or diplomatic reception? Nadil says, hey, maybe she'll surprise you. Don't be so quick to jump to conclusions. Here we kind of get the sense that Odin Ur feels like he's being underutilized. He basically laments the fact that he's been dragged to all these political functions. Give this guy a break, he just wants to study. Anyway, he follows Nadil to the throne room and he's delighted to see his Jedi Master, Uru. If you remember from issue 0 of the Golden Age arc, Uru is this large tentacle brain creature encased in a large yellow crystal filled with liquid. And he also happens to be a Jedi Master. I encourage you to do an internet image search for pictures of Uru to get a real sense of how cool and bizarre he looks. Empress Tita tells Odan Ur that Uru has come to check up on him and see how he's doing as Tita's new advisor. Uru isn't at all surprised when Tita told him that Odan Ur was in his study reading. Odan Ur tells his master that he's been busy and that he misses the days of his peaceful tutelage. Uru responds. He says, A Jedi must learn action as well as knowledge, and desperate times may be approaching us. I know you, my student, and I know you too have been having dark visions. Across the reaches of the galaxy, through seas of dark stars, rivers of whispering black shadow from the Republic's ancient past. 
evil history we had thought forgotten. I know of your attempts to warn the assembly on Coruscant Odanur. You thought your mission was a failure, but others in the audience heard you. Other Jedi Knights. The Republic has had a fairly easy go of it so far, only having to deal with interplanetary squabbles and civil wars. But Uru recognizes that a confrontation with the Sith Empire would be disastrous for them. It would engulf the entire galaxy in conflict. Tita brings Uru out onto a balcony to show him that her factories and shipyards have continued to run, even though the Unification Wars are over. She has spent this time preparing for the defense of the Republic. Even though Coruscant chooses to ignore this threat, the Empress will fight for glory and for the Republic, and she vows never to allow the Koro system to fall into enemy hands. At this point, the story brings us to the Synagogue Detention Center, where Jory is being imprisoned. One of the guards tells her that there's quite the backlog from war crimes trials. After all, the seven planets in the Koro system were only recently unified. Jory settles into her cell and mopes about the fact that no one will listen to her dire warnings about the Sith Empire. Eventually, a guard comes to get her, and when she tries to talk to him, he literally says to her, Tell it to the judge. Jory is shocked that she gets to see a judge the same day she was arrested. I mean, it is pretty surprising considering that, you know, here in this country it takes months and months to see a judge. The guard explains that her case is pretty clear-cut. Unlike the war crimes trials that will likely take forever, this is kind of an open and shut book. I'm getting the sense here that things are not going to go very well for her if they've already decided the verdict. We leave Jory at this point and turn our attention back to Sato's fortress on Cardelba. Sato proclaims to all the Sith Lords present that they are ready to launch their attack on the Republic. At this point, Ludo appears on a hollow projector and makes one last plea to the Sith Lords. He tells them to abandon this madness. His ship is in the sky above the fortress. Sato says to everyone present that the blood of many Sith slaves must run in Ludo's veins. Here again we have this reference to the purity of bloodlines. He turns to Gav and gives him the honor of activating the automated defense systems. Gav, showing how naive he is, thinks he's pressing a button to block the transmission. Sato doesn't try and correct him, he's all like, Just do it. We need to get back to our business. It is a great honor I bestow upon you, Gav Derrigan. Gav presses the button and the ship is blown out of the sky. He's furious with Sato for tricking him. He tells the Sith Lord that he's never killed anyone before. Sato brushes it off and tells Gav not to worry about it. He starts to put on his iconic armor, and then he tells Gav that he put a tracker on Starbreaker 12. In the last panel, just as Gav is finally beginning to realize that this was all kind of a setup, the Sith Lords are preparing their ships for launch. We can see the smoldering ruins of Kresh's ship in the background, above the fortress. Before we move on to issue 2, I want to talk about some of the interesting things that came out of the issue's letter column, Jedi Journals. The first letter is from one David Yu of Sydney, Australia. He points out that Sato calls upon the power of his Jedi blood in issue 2 of the Golden Age arc. Then he asks how we can reconcile this with the notion that Sato is of pure Sith blood. The letter is answered by none other than Kevin J. Anderson himself. He says that the seeming contradiction will have an explanation. So in future episodes, we'll have to watch out for this one and revisit it. My own theory when I first read this series as a kid is that Sato is a pure charlatan. I wouldn't be surprised if he was lying about a lot of things throughout the series, including his bloodline. There's also another letter from one Chris Stith of Princeton, Kentucky, and it's quite a critical letter. He's, he's very harsh on the series. He argues that the portrayal of the dark side and the Sith is all wrong in these comics. He views the Sith and the dark side as an opposite of the Jedi and the light side, two sides of the same coin, if you will. He points out that many of the dark side powers have light side analogs, such as seeing into the future and force choking. And for that last one, he uses the example of Luke choking a Gamorrean guard in Return of the Jedi. The difference lies in the way that Sith and Jedi access the Force. This is what Chris argues in his letter. He thinks that the portrayal of the Sith as aliens that the Dark Jedi dominated is ludicrous. Kevin Anderson again responds to this criticism, and I think his answer is very interesting and well worth sharing. He says this, Sorry you don't like the framework of the Sith and the Dark Jedi, but that background came directly to us from George Lucas himself. We're following his guidelines and building a story within parameters he himself laid down. It may not match your own ideas, but this is George's universe and he gets to establish the rules. We just try to tell the best story we can within them. So there you have it folks, the man himself, the creator of Star Wars, is responsible for the history of the Sith as you see it in this podcast. I can't think of a more legitimizing statement. Legends? Pfft. Canon? Pfft. A Jedi cares not for these things. Okay. Moving on, issue 2 is titled Forces in Collision. I feel like we've been dancing around this whole Invasion of the Republic thing, so let's hope we can finally get some action here. 
The issue opens on a judge peering at a scroll through his monocle. We're told that Jory is in overflow courtroom number four. The judge reads off the charges against her. Grand theft, destruction of property, fraud, resisting arrest, reckless mayhem, etc., etc. He tells her it's quite an impressive list. Jory doesn't even try to defend herself. She's like, yes, I did all those things, but the Republic is in danger. My brother Gav is a prisoner of the Sith Empire. The judge is bored. He tells her he's had quite enough of her ranting and that they don't have time for fairy tales. Jory is to be shipped off to a colony world as part of her punishment. Before the hearing is over, the Trandoshan lizard merchant, Sik Kahur, interrupts the proceedings. He tells the judge that Jory is a known criminal and that he wouldn't be surprised if she murdered her brother and concocted this entire story to cover up her misdeeds. Jory tells Kahur that he better not erase the data on the Nava computer of Starbreaker 12. It's her only way back to Gav. Kahur is like, screw you, I do what I want with my ship. The judge has heard enough. He's already rendered his sentence. Jory is going to be sent to a penal colony on a planet called Ronica. We get some commentary here from the guard who wonders whether or not the court is eager to sentence war criminals just to have cheap workers sent to their colony planets. Jory starts looking through her survival pack, which includes ultraviolet eye shields, emergency scab bandages. We get the sense that Ronica is most definitely not a resort world or a vacation planet. At this point, the scene changes to a magnificent two-page spread. We see a huge, sprawling fortress built on the side of a mountain, with giant statues in various alcoves around the fortress. In front of this massive edifice, there are these large warships with various different symbols on them. And in front of the ships, there are rows and rows of Sith warriors waiting in formation. We're told that this is Chihodos, another planet within the Sith Empire, and the central base of a Sith Lord named Shar Dakan. We're also told that an empire that survives on slavery and exploitation, on oppression and imagined outside threats, must continue to expand or die. Sato has found a new direction in which to expand. Sato tells Gav that the Empire has now found fresh land, fresh resources, and fresh blood in the Republic. Gav is all like, what do you mean by fresh blood? And Sato shrugs it off, telling him it's a figure of speech. Gav, how stupid can you be? The guy literally got you to kill his main political rival last issue. How are you not seeing these red flags? Anyways, putting my frustrations aside, Sato keeps buttering him up, telling him that he'll return home as a glorious hero, someone that history will remember. Sato shows Gav a map of the galaxy and tells him that the fighting shouldn't take all that long. He's predicting a swift victory against the unsuspecting Republic. The next couple panels demonstrate the might of the Sith war machine. We see forces gather from far and wide. We see starships to ground troopers. And we even see the Sith herding giant beasts onto their warships. Like we literally see tusked, hairy mammoth creatures getting corralled into the ships. To use a real-world history analog, it kind of reminds me of Hannibal invading Italy with elephants in the Second Carthaginian War, and we all know how that turned out for Hannibal. And for those of you who don't, spoiler alert, he lost, even with the giant elephants on his side. At this point, we're also introduced to Sato's Sith Meditation Sphere, which is a very unique-looking ship, and pops up again thousands of years later in the Legacy of the Force series, when it is commandeered by none other than Ben Skywalker, Luke Skywalker's son in the Legends continuity. The Meditation Sphere is this oval eye-shaped ship with an actual eye and has these vampire bat wings on either side. It looks organic in nature and it also looks very ancient. Stop what you're doing, pause this podcast, and look it up right now. Sith Meditation Sphere. You'll see what I mean. So we learn that Sato will be directing the attack from this ship. The Sith boast to each other that such a force has never been gathered so quickly in the history of the galaxy. So here the stage is set. The ships are finally ready to launch. Before we see that happen, the issue brings us to a new location. Ronica. This is the colony planet that Jory was sent to. We see her hard at work, literally breaking rocks with a pickaxe. In the span of five or six panels, Jory decides to stage a prison break. She calls a guard over, claiming she was bit by a poisonous stinger moth. When the guard comes round and tells her to hold still, she bludgeons him with a rock and makes off for one of the transport shuttles nearby. Guards begin to fire at her, but she manages to safely make it aboard an empty ship. Before they can do anything further, she gets the ship running and begins to fly away. These guys aren't very good at security. We hear angry guards in the background paging their security forces. No, this isn't a drill, you idiot. One of the workers stole an ore shuttle and is heading towards orbit. Intercept her! Security ships surround Jory's shuttle and begin to shoot at her, but it looks like they can't penetrate the shuttle's shields. Jory manages to fly the shuttle all the way back to Sinagar, but there, security forces are already waiting for her. 
She careens towards the atmosphere while the ships continually fire on her. Before she can meet the same fate as her parents, she literally parachutes off the ship James Bond style and starts to direct her flow towards Empress Tita's palace. Now, I don't even want to get into the amount of disbelief that needs to be suspended here. Not only did Jory manage to pull off a successful prison break, but now she's exactly where she needs to be. I'll chalk this one up to the fact that the Force works in mysterious ways. Not a very satisfying answer, but let's remember that this is the same universe where nearly everything is tied to one family, so not entirely implausible within the framework of the story. In the dead of night, Jory sneaks towards the palace, and she begins to scale the walls. She lets herself in through a window and begins to look for Empress Tita. She eventually makes her way to the throne room and ambushes Empress Tita, who is unsurprisingly hard at work. The Empress mistakes this for an assassination attempt and calls for her guards, but because she's a badass, she also grabs a giant spear to defend herself. Jory begs her to listen and says, Look, I came all the way from the Sith Empire. She explains that her brother is a captive and that they plan to launch an attack any day now. With tears streaming down her face, she pulls out an amulet that her brother gave her and tells the Empress that the Sith Lords use it to focus their powers. Again, how did the guards who imprison her not confiscate this thing? I don't even want to know where Jory hid it to escape detection. Anyway, Odan Hur hears all of this, and he's all like, this is just as my visions predicted. Jory tells the Empress who she is, and at this point, it looks like someone is finally going to listen to her. To underscore that point, Mehmet Nadil comes forth, and he puts his hand on her shoulder, comforting her. Nadil tells the Empress that now, perhaps they can rally some of the other Jedi Knights. Empress Tita is basically like, we have no time. Here's what she says. Our newly unified worlds form a bastion of strength in this sector. But I am afraid. The great ocean of the Republic is woefully unprepared for any outside threat. I see we shall have to provide a good example for our skeptical allies. Now, here, the story flashes back to the Sith Empire. Gav tells Sato that the entire fleet is assembled, but he questions the wisdom of leaving the Sith Empire practically undefended. Sato is not fazed by it. He tells Gav that they already control the Sith Empire. They need these ships to concentrate on their new target, the Republic. Sato takes the opportunity to tell Gav that he wants this young man to command the fleet from his flagship. He tells him that it's the best way to prove himself. Gav is all like, whoa, hold on a second, I've never commanded anything before. And Sato assures him that the Misasi warriors will assist him, but that Gav will get the final say in all the decision making. Somehow I don't believe him. Anyway, Sato retreats to the heart of the Meditation Spear to concentrate and use the old and forbidden Sith ways. We learn that much of the attack will be a mere illusion, but oftentimes belief can be as destructive as actual weapons. The second issue ends with an order given from the Meditation Sphere. Sith Fleet launch. The Republic will be ours, and so we see the entire fleet enter into hyperspace. Okay. So no big space battles yet, but surely, surely the next issue must have some kind of confrontation. And as luck would have it, we'll be discussing it in this very episode. But before we get there, I want to again briefly highlight some of the comments made in the letters column. In this issue's Jedi Journals, Frederick D. Weaver of Washington, D.C. makes a pretty astute observation about Gavin Jory. I think what makes these characters compelling and credible is that they aren't seeking to be major historical figures. All they wanted to do was earn an honest living as hyperspace explorers, and much like in real life, these ordinary people have found themselves swept up in major historical events, not even realizing just how big of a role they would play in the outcome. With that food for thought, I'd like to turn to issue 3. This is the last story that we'll be covering in today's episode. First off, again, I'm going to ask you for the third time, go to your computer, open up a search engine, and type in Fall of the Sith Empire issue 3, and check out the amazing cover art by Duncan Fagredo. I can't rave enough about it. The ancient Egypt motif is heavy, but we also get this incredibly sweet picture of Odan Ur wielding a green lightsaber, and it shows you what these ancient lightsabers look like. Like I said before, they're hooked up to power packs that the Jedi carry with them on their sides. Episode 3 is titled, First Encounter. One interesting bit of trivia is that it's also the shortest issue in this particular arc. That said, it's probably the most action-packed so far, so you're definitely going to want to stick around. The issue opens with Sik Kahur the lizard Trandoshan merchant, and he's taking Starbreaker 12 out for a joyride in space. As soon as I cracked open this issue, I was like, nobody cares about this lizard guy. He's kind of a slime ball. Wouldn't it be funny if the Sith fleet comes out of hyperspace right on top of him? Well, guess what? That's exactly what happens. Kahura's navigator starts to panic. Ships, lots of ships, and they're close! The next panel shows Kahura looking out of the viewport at a massive battle fleet, led by the Sith Meditation Sphere. 
Kahur also starts to panic, and he tells the navigator to get them the hell out of Dodge. Sato commands his ship to target the Starbreaker 12. Gav cuts in being like, wait, what are you doing? Jory could be on that ship. Sato ignores him and orders the fleet to fire. The ship explodes in a ball of flame. Gav grimaces and he tells Sato that his sister better not have been on that ship. Channeling his inner Lando Calrissian, he says, this deal's getting worse all the time. Sato brushes it off. He tells Gav to check his sensors. There were no human life forms on that ship. Pretty wild that these primitive ships have sensors that are fine enough to distinguish between alien physiology like that, but apparently they do. Sato gives the fleet their orders. He tells them to strike swiftly and decisively. He plans to crush any resistance before the Republic can pull all of its fleets together. The narrative flashes to Coruscant, the heart of the Republic. Memon Adil disembarks from a ship, and there he greets three of his fellow Jedi who have come to meet him. They tell him that the Jedi Knights will stand with him and defend the Republic. Before they can assess the planetary defenses, alarms begin to sound. Nadil realizes he did not arrive soon enough, and that the Sith are already here. A massive invasion fleet appears in the skies above Coruscant. To give you a sense of the scope, we're told there are tens of thousands of ships. The bigger ships begin launching drop pods that crash onto Coruscant's surface. These drop pods open up and thousands of Sith warriors begin to spill out. And. To make matters worse, they're followed by none other than those giant beasts that I talked about last issue. You know, the ones that are kind of like mammoth or elephant-like. Anyways, one of the Sith Lords who's riding one of these beasts leads the charge. He reminds the troops that Sato has directed them to capture the heart of the government. He commands them to crush anything that stands in their way, and it's all done in the name of the Dark Lord of the Sith. Okay, here's where things start to get real very quickly. The next panels comprise a two-page spread depicting an all-out war on Coruscant. Innocent civilians are being trampled by these massive beasts. Sith warriors are ripping into the crowds as they fight their way towards the Senate Hall. <laughs> Mehmet Nadil and his fellow Jedi ignite their lightsabers and make their stands on the steps to the Senate building. Nadil tells his fellow Jedi to stand firm for the forces with them, and the Jedi have fought to protect the Republic for a hundred generations. In response, the Sith warriors scream the name Sado as they jump into the fray, attacking guard and Jedi alike. It's absolute madness, a battle worthy of something you'd see in Return of the King when all the forces of Middle-earth meet to repel Sauron. Back in Sinigar, in Empress Tita's palace, she's in front of her tactical screens tracking the invasion in real time. Again, she's wearing some very badass armor, and she's ready for war. Jory and Odan Ur are beside her. Jory makes the observation that the Sith are striking everywhere at once, and Odan Ur tells her that this is even worse than his nightmare. The Empress is all like, look, Coruscant ignored our warnings, fine, but now we have to launch everything that we have to stop this invasion. One of her advisors points out that their own ships may not even be enough to defend the Koro system against the size of the Sith fleet, let alone the rest of the Republic. One of the leaders of the rebel forces comes forth at this point, and he kneels in front of Empress Tita. While it's not quite clear how he's made it into the palace, I guess I shouldn't be surprised considering Jory broke in pretty easily last issue. The rebel leader tells the Empress that his forces will fight with her in exchange for amnesty. The Empress takes him up on his offer. I mean, she'd be crazy not to. She needs everybody she can get. She decides to recall all the prisoners of war sent to the penal colony, and vows that they can have their lives back if anyone actually survives this war. In the next panel, we see another two-page spread. The sky is filled with Empress Tita's defense fleet. Planetary turbo lasers stand at the ready, and Tita is in full battle armor, riding on a tusked creature, holding her weapon of choice, a giant spear. This is what she says. Launch my battleships. We must defend our world with blood. Beautiful Sinagar must not fall to the Sith. Many of our warships were damaged or destroyed in the recent unification wars, but I think we can still make a good accounting of ourselves. Jory asks for a ship, but the Empress turns her down. Then Jory asks for a weapon. She tells them that she needs to fight. Odan Ur presents her with a lightsaber and tells her to take the Sword of the Jedi and use it well. Jory slips away, still determined to find a ship. She decides to check out Arba the Hutt's dockyard. I guess old habits die hard, you know, like stealing from a kindly hut who took you under his flab when life got tough. At this point, we learn that Gav is actually in one of the command ships above Sinigar. He decides that he wants to take a transport down to the planet. One of the Sith Lords chastises him, reminding Gav that Sado put him in charge of the fleet. Gav is all like, relax, I'll take some Masasi with me and we'll try and shut down the planet's defenses so we can have a near bloodless victory. So here, I have a correction of sorts to make. 
it's actually made clear to us that the planet itself is called Koros Major. Sinigar, on the other hand, is the name of the capital city on this planet, and the capital city of the Koros system. I've been using Sinigar for the name of the planet, but that's actually not true. This would kind of be like calling all of Japan by the name of Tokyo. Humble apologies for the error. So to set the record straight, the planet is called Koros Major, and the capital city is called Sinigar. As Gav approaches the planet in a transport shuttle, his amulet begins to react. He takes it to mean that Jory must be close by, since she has the counterpart. When he sees Sinigar in flames, he begins to tear up. And I want to pause for a moment and point out that Gav is also fully decked out in some kind of warlord armor. He's wearing this ceremonial headpiece and a cape. It looks like Sato spared no expense when it came to setting up his protege. So the amulet leads Gav directly to Arba the Hutt's space dock. He enters the building with his Masasi warriors in tow. Arba, old friend, I need your help to find Jory. Arba is furious. He calls Gav a traitorous salt monger. Before he can get another word out, a Masasi warrior takes out a spear and two hands it right into Arba the Hutt. Gav's horrified face is spattered in green blood as he tells the warrior to stop. With his remaining strength, Arba uses his body to roll onto and crush several of the Masasi warriors present. Before we go on, I want to take a moment of silence for one of my favorites. Arba the Hutt, you were too good for this world and we didn't deserve you. Okay, so Gav is standing above Arba's dead body and he loses it. He says, what have you done? He wasn't a threat. He wasn't attacking me. In one of the most poorly timed reunions ever, Jory walks in on Gav. She sees Arba dead in front of him and immediately jumps to the conclusion that Gav killed him. In fairness to Jory, I don't really blame her. Gav is standing there, covered in Arba's blood, flanked by Sith warriors, and dressed like a Sith lord. It definitely looks bad. She tells him that she doesn't know who he is anymore, and that he's not her brother. She activates her lightsaber. It's a glowing blue blade, and she says that Odan Ur gave her this lightsaber for a reason, to fight evil in all of its forms. Gav begs for her to let him explain, but she doesn't even bother listening. She jumps at him and slashes across his midsection in a mighty swing. Before we can see whether Gav survives her attack, the story shifts to Kirik. You may remember from our first episode that Kirik was the last planet Empress Tita needed to unify in the Koro system. And I looked it up on Wikipedia, the planet is actually named Kirik, it's not some city name, it's the planet name. Anyways, it's where Gav and Jory's parents met their untimely end. Odan Ur stands beside Jedi Master Uru. He is reflecting on the irony of the fact that he once fought against these rebels, and now he is helping lead them into battle. Master Uru replies that the Force often works in complex patterns. He tells Odan Ur that he will join him in the struggle. We learn that reinforcements are coming from the penal colony on Ronica, but that the rebels need to hold out against the Sith forces until they arrive. As the rebels ready their defenses, dropships begin to crash land onto the planet's surface. Much like on Coruscant, Sith warriors spill out of these ships with their massive beasts. One of them holds forth a sword and screams, Tear down the citadel, we will leave nothing but rubble. The issue ends with a rebel telling his men to prepare for the fight of their lives, for the Battle of Kirik has begun. Well, that's it folks. We've covered the first three out of five issues in this arc, and what an issue to end on. Before we cap off on today's episode, I want to take one last dive into the Jedi Journal's letters column. William G. Schiffbauer of WGS Law wrote a letter asking why, in some of the earlier depictions of Sato, he is portrayed as a human sorcerer. The editor responds and acknowledges that they screwed up in their earlier interpretations of Sato. It is confirmed that Sato is a Sith, the race, not the religion. He is not a human, despite some artistic renditions that would suggest otherwise. So, now that we've cleared that up, we can end this episode properly. Honestly, I hate to leave you all in suspense about the fate of Gav, but I also want you coming back for more. So join me next time as we conclude The Fall of the Sith Empire. And may the Force be with you, always.